Wir haben zu Besuch den Gründer von Wall Street Bets, Jamie Rogozinski. Keine Angst, es wird nicht wieder das x-te Gespräch um GameStop herum. Nein, wir haben zig Themen auf Lage. Wir sprechen über die verschiedenen neuen Arten der Investoren, über Meme-Investoren als gleichberechtigter Investor-Art, Genre neben einem Value-Investor? Über Frauen als bessere Spekulanten, über Trading als Freizeitaktivität, als Hobby statt als Investition. Wir sprechen über Politik und Regularien. Über Boomer und Millennials können diese beiden Investmentgruppen nebeneinander koexistieren. Wir sprechen über seine Lieblingsgeschichten, über Wall Street Pets. Wir sprechen über Leerverkauf und die physische Preisfindung beim Silber und viele weitere Themen. Also bleiben Sie dran. Wir begrüßen Jamie Rogozinski bei uns. Unternehmer und vor allem Gründer von Wall Street Bets. Willkommen, Jamie. Hi, thank you for, for having me. Wir haben uns schon vor geraumer Zeit für dieses Interview verabredet, vor der ganzen GameStop-Situation. Mittlerweile hat jeder von GameStop und vor allem von Wall Street Bets gehört. Und einige wundern sich, hey, Internetforen zum Thema Aktien gab es schon immer. Was macht hier den Unterschied aus? Jamie, was ist der Unterschied? Ist es, sind es die fehlenden Ordergebühren? Ist es die junge Generation? Was macht den Unterschied aus? I, I would say the brutal honesty is what, what sets it apart. Uh, all the forums, when I was looking for, for a place to learn and to, to have a community with, and even to this day, everyone that talks about trading talks about it in a really pretentious manner. Um, or sometimes they'll be selective with what they share. Mainly, they'll share their successful trades or their successful wins or how much money they're making. But very few places uh, are, are open about the fact that they lose money as well as make money. And both both uh, conversations are equally welcome. And that same refreshing honesty translates into the way they talk about the market. A lot of people have been calling the market speculative and casino as far as time goes back. And uh, in, in, in this forum, people talk about it as if it's a casino. They're just calling it for what it is. And well, specifically the way that they choose to use the, the markets as a casino. And so they use language that resembles that. And Wall Street Bets user investieren ihr eigenes Geld und nicht das anderer Leute. Und wie Sie bereits sagten, Sie sind sehr ehrlich, auch was Versagen angeht. Extreme Beispiele von Misserfolg als auch von Erfolg, Millionen Gewinne und Millionen Verluste. That's correct. Yeah, there's, you know, fortunes made and lost. I would say the people that make and lose millions are, are more the exception. Of course, they get a lot of attention. And so it's sometimes misleading into thinking that everybody is doing that. Um, most people on Wall Street bets are... are Uh, trading with smaller accounts and they're making smaller sums of money or they're losing smaller sums of money. But there certainly are a lot of people, uh, notable, you know, a lot of notable people that have made tremendous amounts of money as well as lost tremendous amounts of money. Die GEMA. Ich würde behaupten, wir haben eine Subkultur der GEMA und diese wird immer größer und tritt auch verstärkt in der Öffentlichkeit in Erscheinung. Wir hatten Gamergate, als die GEMA sich zum ersten Mal überhaupt organisierten und ihre eigene Macht spürten, als auch ähm, zum Beispiel ich schneide Videos und eines der populärsten YouTube-Videos dazu ist von jemandem, der äh, Videospielstrategien des Speedrunnings anwendet für das Schneiden von Videos. Sehen wir nun beides auch in der Finanzwelt, also Gamer, die sich organisieren, um einen Short Squeeze durchzuführen, als auch Gamer, die Strategien aus der Videospielszene anwenden, aber nun für das Investieren. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, this is this was a large topic in in the book uh, that I wrote. I had a, a, an entire chapter named Charles Schwab, Charles Schwab meet Candy Crush, right? And the, the idea is that finance and video games are colliding with each other. This new generation, uh, these younger generation of millennials and Generation Z, they grew up with video games, some very sophisticated, some of them were simple, uh, a lot of them interact exclusively on their phone, and uh, and there is a, a gamification element to the interface. The, the brokers um, uh, use a lot of animations and a lot of feel that, that resembles that a game, but also the mentality of these traders is that of 
trying to find a way to beat the level or to find a cheat code or to, to, to try to, to find a shortcut. And this GameStop uh, example is the latest and I would say the biggest example of it. But if you rewind uh, back, you know, six months, a year, two years, you'll find that they've done this time and time again with different strategies. They've, they've done short squeezes before, but they've also they've also identified uh, um, oversights from a broker to notably get infinite leverage or, or get uh, very, very high amounts of buying power with a very small deposit um, and, and similar things like that. They find these these vulnerabilities and they exploit them as if it was a video game. That mentality very much translates. We have the value investor, we have the chart trader and so on. Is the Wall Street Bets investor a völlig neues genre? It is. They've carved out a new niche for themselves. This is, it's a new genre. You have the Warren Buffetts of the world, which are these fundamental investors that buy and hold forever. They have a, a sophisticated analysis process where they go through and they try and calculate the book value and the fair value and find inefficiencies. And uh, that, that continues to work, this long-term investing and collecting dividends, etc., You also have traders that are day traders that have been around for years. Um, these are individuals that look at technical analysis, they look at chart patterns, or they look at different indicators. Uh, you have uh, another uh, category, which would be the, the high frequency trading, which of these are computers that use statistics and uh, take advantage of their, their high execution, or sorry, their fast execution to, to, to find some edge. And now we have this new genre, right, which they can all coexist. And, and these are, are, I mean, they're starting to call them meme investors, right? They make jokes about the investments they're going to make. They, they put up funny videos and pictures and Uh, they'll they'll come up with new terms around things, and they have fun while doing this. And it's it's proven to be successful, I, I believe, for a, a handful of reasons. One, we've had a trending market forever, as well, or at least for as long as these this generation has been trading. Um, and so this trending market really helps that type of mentality where they just need to know whether the market's going up or down. The market's been going up for about 10 years, and so pretty much anything that they can, uh, or even more than 10 years, anything that they pick is probably going to be a good – Uh, a good trade. And then and then on the times that we've had uh, a downturn in the market, like we had in March of 2020, the they quickly adjusted and they said they decided, okay, well, now we're going to go short. And then they went short the market and they made money that way. And then eventually they turned back around. So uh, so they've, they've figured out a strategy that works under these conditions. And they've also because I mean, what we saw in GameStop is not only does it work, They've now been able to influence the outcome, the probability of the outcome of their trade. All right. If you're making a trade, uh, sorry, if you're making a bet in a casino or on a horse race, it doesn't matter how much money you throw at it. The, the probability doesn't affect the outcome of the race. But now, because this this group of people is so large, even if individually they have smaller amounts of money, they can collectively move things in their favor and actually have a better shot at winning, as we saw with GameStop. Man könnte argumentieren, dass sie ihre eigene Welle erschaffen. Sie interpretieren nicht den Markt, sondern schaffen ihn. Ist dies tatsächlich deren Kreation oder, wie andere meinen, Marktmanipulation? Well, I, you know, I would say what we saw with GameStop and a handful of other stocks, and we've seen it a couple times before, Uh, it's what label we want to put on it. I'm not really sure. I think everyone's trying to figure that out. Uh, the, the, you know, I know that if it was outright illegal manipulation, then somebody would have already been in trouble for that. Uh, I've heard people say this is a perfect business, uh, case for, for, uh, um, graduate students as well as perfect legal question on the, on the final exam. So we'll, we'll see that we'll find out whether or not there's, there's legal manipulation or not. Um, but there's certainly been affecting the price. There's no doubt about that. The, the price swings that we saw uh, in the, the past couple of weeks have been um, very outside of the normal, many standard deviations outside of what we get to see. Uh, but that's not necessarily what they always do. Sometimes their their approach to investing isn't with GameStop. It's with the S&P 500. And it doesn't matter how many individuals 
you have trying to make these trades. You can't pump or you, you can't you can't manipulate the S and P five hundred. Um, not not nearly. I mean, you would need a, a much much larger amount of money to be able to move that. But they still join into it. So occasionally they've been able to move the stock prices, GameStop and maybe five six other ones that I can think of. Uh, but but a lot of times it's not. A lot of times it's just let's identify the trade and I'll jump on it. And because of the trending market, they've been able to be right quite a lot. Und sie machen es für alle transparent. Niemand versteckt sich hinter dem Vorhang oder hinter verschlossenen Türen. Nein, da wird alles mit der ganzen Welt geteilt. Yeah, and once again, that, that goes back to the refreshing honesty, and that's also what's kept them out of trouble, right? So the the laws, the regulations that are in place, very specifically outline that you have to mislead. An unwitting investor in order for this to be against the rules. You need to lie about the stock. You need to provide inside information that's not publicly available. Uh, you need to be owners of the stock trying to promote, you know, by, by falsifying orders. Or There's a lot of different ways to do it, but all of them have fraudulent intentions uh, in mind. These people are being open. They're saying, I want to buy the stock because it's going to go up and it's going to go to the moon or because we're going to short squeeze it. You know, they're not trying to fraud to defraud some investor on the other side. Boomer. Das Wort ist mittlerweile auch in Europa ein Begriff und sie sagten einmal, dass die Bubble, die Blase ein Boomer Wort wäre, ja. denn Millennials sind Dividenden egal und wenn die Aktie fällt, dann ändern sie halt ihre Strategie und setzen auf fallende Aktien und fallende Märkte. That's correct and that's what we saw last year. The markets fell 50%. Right. A lot of times that, that I get these interviews, a lot of people make references to, uh, to how the stocks, they, they don't always go up. And sometimes there's a crash and they make a reference to the, the Great Depression or to 1987, to 2000.com bubble, to, to 2008, the financial bubble. But they omit the last version, the last one, right? The one that we had last year. It was a really big fall, 50 percent of the market. Um, now we recovered really quickly. I think they've, they've said in large part because of these retail investors, but yeah, these, the, the mentality of these investors or traders or participants is different than that of what I call boomers, uh, or older participants. Why? Because they were, grew up in the financial crisis and were affected by it and were marked by it. A lot of these uh, people were in college at the time. They graduate with a lot of debt, uh, with student debt, and they don't have jobs. They have to move back with their parents. The parents sometimes lose their jobs and sometimes their home. So that distrust has been ingrained for a long time. So they look at the Wall Street as, okay, well, we understand that this thing can ruin your life, so we're not going to go ahead and rely on it. But we can try and make some money with this. And they go in and they go out very quickly. They make these short-term trades. They oftentimes use stock options, which by definition have, uh, a, a, I guess you can vary it, but a lot of these people choose these short-term expiration stock uh, options, which forcibly make them to make these little quick moves. And so if there's a crash, it only affects people that were planning on retiring with their fund in the next few years or whatever it might be. These guys just wake up in the morning and say, oh, okay, so market's going down now? Perfect. Now I just need to buy puts or I need to short the stock. And that's how we make money today. And it's just a matter of direction. They're not, they're not waiting for dividends, like I said. Max Kaiser spricht oft von einer Dystopie über den Casino Gulag. Sind wir bereits in einer solchen Dystopie, bei der Menschen ihre Sozialhilfe verwetten, als Chance für ein besseres Leben? Mm, I, you know, I think everyone has the hopes that they get a better life. And, and a lot of people notably have uh, uh, gotten a better life. And, and some people haven't. I'd like to think the majority of the people are rational. I like to give all of humanity more of a benefit of a doubt. Uh, where they're taking whatever exposed, uh, dispensable income that they have. Disposable income, sorry. Uh, you know, maybe a few hundred dollars or maybe a few thousand dollars and they try to place these really leveraged bets and they sometimes make money and sometimes they lose money and sometimes they make a lot of money. And I've seen in many occasions that people that make a lot of money take, you know, you know, they, they, they take a lot of the money, they, they put it in their savings accounts and then they, they may continue to play with it, but they use that money for a better life. Uh, I don't necessarily think that the majority of the people are going in here 
and, and mortgaging their house and ruining their lives for it. Surely there has to be examples of it, just like you have examples of people that go to actual casinos and have uh, problems with gambling. Most people go, they have fun, they understand whatever money they take to the casino is probably going to get lost. But the hope is that they, they, they're able to make a lot of money. Der Casino Aspekt ist sehr wichtig. Sie sagen, dass Sie kontaktiert werden für Spiel- und Wettberatung statt für Investmentberatung. Womit das für die Leute kein Investment ist, also eine Order ist kein Investment, sondern es ist eine Ausgabe, ähnlich einem Lotterieschein. Und wenn es gut geht, super, wenn nicht, ja, dann sehen wir uns wieder beim nächsten Gehaltseingang. Ähm, ist dies der Schlüssel, um Wall Street Bad zu verstehen und können diese beiden Welten überhaupt koexistieren? Also die Boomer mit ihrer Dividende und die Leute von Wall Street Bads? Oder sind wir bereits nahe dran an einem harten Durchgreifen mit Regularien? Ja, yeah, they can go coexist and they do coexist. Um, you know, Warren Buffett continues to do well for himself. He he's not affected by these shorter term fluctuations. This GameStop situation, uh, even though it did have ripple effects across the market because of the mechanics of it, it forced a lot of funds to sell other stocks in order to, to meet capital requirements. And that affected the price of those stocks. Eventually, everything level levels out again. And in the long term, the, the, the time horizon that Warren Buffett's of the world are using the market for continued to use it in that uh, in that manner, and they continue to use it successfully. Uh, you can just like you also have the short term traders that use technical analysis and high frequency use their own approach. And I have these meme traders; they they got, all can coexist. And these these this younger generation is like you, you very well um, put it. This is more of an expense, and it's, it can be considered almost an entertainment expense, just like. Um, some people might consider, you know, going to a concert or buying some fancy uh, clothes or, or whatever it might be. They, they consider this to be an activity and one that is a great learning experience. At the end of the world, all of these people are learning about the world of finance, which I think is really valuable. And they're enjoying it. And sometimes they make money and sometimes they lose money. Um, and the third thing about this is uh, I forgot I had a third point, but I'm sure it'll come back to me. Jeder Beruf hat ein paar komplizierte Fachbegriffe, um den anderen Glauben zu machen, dass sie es nie verstehen werden und besser daran tun, wenn man die Dienste desjenigen in Anspruch nimmt. Zum Beispiel in der Finanzwelt, im Optionshandel, die Griechen. Ist, ähm, jetzt haben wir mit Wall Street Bets eine völlig andere Situation. Da gibt es Leute, die auf Memes traden von John Wick und erfolgreich damit sind oder eigentlich Zoom traden wollen, aber dann die Ticker vertauschen und eine völlig andere Aktie traden und damit noch eine höhere Rendite erzielen als mit Zoom selbst. Sie haben Kontakt zu beiden Lagern. Wie verärgert ist die Wall Street? You know, I think that people hope that Wall Street is pissed off because it feels good. And I, I know that there's some people that are pissed off because there's a lot of people that have lost money. Um, but I also like to give credit where it's due. Wall Street is in it for making money. They're smart. They've been at this for a lot longer than these generations have. And they're just looking for an opportunity to make money, too. When you have a group of people, a group of participants that are using the market in this way and are moving the market in this way, this creates a lot of inefficiencies in the price discovery process. Those inefficiencies are dollar signs for Wall Street. And so they are quickly adjusting or they're quickly coming up with new strategies to add to, to whatever they already have to capitalize on on this new um, these new new factors that are affecting the market. I've seen a lot of efforts towards collecting sentiment online from social media, from Wall Street bets to try and gain, analyze the comments and things like that to see if they can also uh, profit from it. So they're looking for a way to make money from this too. I, I wouldn't say that they're necessarily uh, pissed off. They, the, the ones that lost money, I think are pissed off, but most of them are saying, all right, let's find a way to make money. I know that there was a fund or two, two individuals that made $700 million on the GameStop Uh, because they decided to to make the correct trades and take advantage of the opportunity. So 
Wall Street's in it for the money, and they're <laughs> they're only happy if they they uh, sorry they're only unhappy if they lose money, which was a, a case. But um, I, my, my guess is they're making money too. Sie sagen, dass die Wall Street anspruchsvolle Software nutzt, um das Denken in den Foren für sich auszunutzen oder sich in das Denken der User hineinversetzen zu können. Ist es auch möglich, dass die Wall Street sich unter die Leute mischt, um die Menge zu manipulieren, oder ist die Menge schon viel zu groß geworden? You know, they might try it. I, I can't. I mean, first of all, the people that would try it, my guess, wouldn't be Wall Street themselves. It might actually be, well, who knows? Anyone that tries to do this um, might have a difficult time. Um, when you want to create a viral video, There's no formula. There's no rhyme or reason. You know, there's the video of the guy on TikTok skateboarding with his cranberry juice. The, the, that video could have been anything, and it was a huge hit. That person could try and replicate that success, and, and he may or may not have luck with this. Um, this What we saw with GameStop, this manipulation effort, uh, takes an element of luck, just like a viral video does. But there was also a lot of technical components behind GameStop specifically that made it susceptible to manipulation. It's a little more technical than the, the mainstream media makes it out to be. Um, they would not have been able to make the same uh, effects had they chosen Apple, for example, or Microsoft. Die Politik hat Wall Street Bets für sich entdeckt und es kommt zu ungewöhnlichen Koalitionen. Die marxistische Kongressabgeordnete Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez steht auf der Seite der Kleinanleger. Wie ist Ihre Einschätzung der Zukunft? Werden wir nun verstärkt Regularien beobachten können, die dem Normalbürger und dem Kleinanleger am Ende schaden? Oder werden wir jetzt hier eine Diskussion anstoßen können darüber, dass es beim Leerverkauf vielleicht nicht das Beste ist, wenn man mehr als 100 Prozent einer Aktiengesellschaft shorten kann? Oder dass wir beim Silber eine physische Preisfindung benötigen. Yeah, so <laughs> it's funny you called her a Marxist. I haven't sure I'd, I'd heard that before, but still, still uh, on point. You know, the, the politicians at this point, surprisingly, they didn't go into a um, their typical bipartisan approach where the the Democrats take one stance and the Republicans take the other ones. We actually saw a, a case where. AOC tweeted something uh, about this case, and then um, Ted Cruz retweeted her and said he agrees. Uh, so th this is one of those rare instances uh, where we see that. Also, the, the congressional hearings that took place were surprisingly non-bipartisan. Um, what, what the approach, you know, the argument that, that, that made its way into politics was primarily Uh, revolving around the fact that the individuals that were trading were disadvantaged because of some subsequent problems with with brokers being able to execute trades. And they felt that the small guys were winning and the big guys, meaning Wall Street, decided to, to put the stops uh, and, and hurt the little guys. And that was the narrative. Uh, it wasn't entirely wrong, but it was but, but it was a little oversimplified. Um, so those conversations were let's protect the individuals. They're really happy about the fact that the that you know people are empowering themselves. They're really happy about people are learning and people are sharing. Um, there are some concerns regarding the the fragility of the market, and there there are some that I personally share. And there's a lot of systemic risks with the market that are wide open, and we've come really close to letting those dominoes fall more than people wish to know. Uh, there's, it's a very complex system. It's very interconnected. What we saw with GameStop, namely that the brokers had to stop allowing, a lot of brokers had to stop allowing the purchase of additional shares, um, not because of the, you know, not because of pressure by, by Wall Street, but because of the internal mechanics of, of the market. Uh, and the settlement process and the collateral requirements and the clearing houses and the settlement times to uh, that's one of many examples. And I do believe that the this episode is going to allow regulators and legislators to try and strengthen that a little bit. I don't think they're interested in limiting the activity. I think that is um, Uh, not very productive, right? If you start limiting the amount of volume you have, then you're affecting the price discovery process, which was towards the end of the, your question. 
Um, not being able to short over a hundred percent, that is why is a technical, uh, that is a systemic f- failure and they should address that because that can lead to other problems. Arguments can be made that it's fine, but I think more arguments can be made that it runs a lot of risks. People can still short the stock. They just can't short stock that don't exist. Um, th- things of that nature. And, and I think that is going to make the world of finance, or not just in the U.S., but, but around the world, more stable. And the whole financial world is interconnected. Um, and then your question regarding the price discovery with silver, can, can you repeat that? Denken Sie, dass wir die Notwendigkeit entdecken für eine physische Preisfindung beim Silber, also statt mit Papiersilber. Also wie die Silberenthusiasten argumentieren, den Leerverkauf von Papiersilber zu verbieten. No, I don't think, you know, they can't, if you want to try and contain that issue with the price manipulation of, of silver through derivatives and ETFs and things of that nature, which is what you're calling paper silver, the, it, you're affecting the market once again, right? There's a lot of, there's there's reasons to have silver and copper in gold for different reasons, right? So construction uh, companies might be interested in, in, in copper because of their uh, products, right? And so they might be interested in buying futures in that because that can help them uh, assure the prices and be able to do projections. So there's there's legitimate reasons for them to do that. And then those, those individuals can take the physical delivery if they choose, or they can just use it as insurance if they choose. Uh, and that, that, that process of discovering price is important in all commodities and energies and, and just, just about anything in order for a market to function properly. If you're forcing people to buy physical metals in order to, to assess its price, you're already affecting its price because maybe I wanted to buy silver, but I don't feel like going to the store, right? Maybe I wanted to buy gold, but I don't have where to store it because I live in a bad neighborhood. Um, and so that's going to affect the price of gold, gold in a negative uh, it, it impact. It's gonna, it's, it reduces the amount of information in the market or it mixes it up because now you're seeing a combination of, um, of uh, supply and demand along with the logistics of, of taking delivery. We saw such problem um, last year with oil when it went negative, right? The price of oil went negative because – of logistical delivery problems with coronavirus and there was no place to store the oil. Um, that's the kind of thing that happens if you decide to, to, <laughs> to, to, to force people into physical instead of um, derivatives. Sie sagen, dass die Wall Street Bets User Spaß haben, aber auch voneinander lernen. In all den Jahren, die Sie persönlich auf der Plattform zugebracht haben, was haben Sie in Ihrem Trading Verhalten geändert? Was haben Sie von anderen Usern gelernt? I have learned everything I know from Wall Street Bets. I mean, everything with regards to the market, and I can say that with confidence, I've learned from directly from Wall Street Bets or, or somewhat indirectly where they led me in the right direction, and then, I, and then I read up on it, more so than anything that I learned in school. Finance uh, in school teaches you very valuable things that you can use in a lot of aspects of your life, right? If you're in the world of finance for mergers and acquisitions and trying to f- calculate the value of money through – Uh, you know, discounted cash flows and blah, 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 you know, working with financial sheet, all that stuff is really valuable. And it works. Uh, it, it also works for um, fundamental investors like like Warren Buffett, who want to try and calculate, uh, you know, the, the fair values and book values and make projections based off of that. When it comes to the market, none of that applies. There's there's so much so much out there from the mechanics to the purpose of it to the derivatives to to you know the the execution process to the, the actual price setting to the rules there's there's a ton of it uh, and and some of it spills into the economy which is a different topic but i've learned it everything through it and it has been changing throughout the years i'd say when i started uh, i knew very very basics about the stocks i know what a stock is and i know that it goes up or it goes down and you can buy it and i think i knew back then that you could short it as well uh, and then i shortly learned about stock options which are pretty common extremely complicated um, they can be if you want them to be complicated and they can also be simpler if you want them to be simpler 
Uh, but they're fascinating. I learned about the derivatives and the ETFs and all sorts of stuff. And I learned about strategies that were that were closer to what I'm now calling boomer strategies, right? These are trading through technical analysis and things of that nature, arbitrage. Uh, but, but as the years went by, I started learning and started opening my mind to the fact that there's there's becoming a new a new style of, of investing or participating of trading in the market that is very successful. I, I had a conversation with a guy. Uh, a couple of weeks ago who said he's been trading the market as long as I have. And so he's taken this wisdom for the past 10 or 12 years about how you can get lucky at first and how the things will eventually you have to be careful and you have risk management and you have all sorts of fancy things. And his wife just started trading a year or two ago. Uh, and she she had the typical beginner's luck, and he warned her. He said, "No, well, you have to be careful because it happens to everyone. You start off, you're lucky. Just be humble uh, because if not, the market's going to do it for you." But it's been two years now, and she's made so much money. She's made a whole a, a lot more money than he has, and so he's tired of saying you're going to learn your lesson one day because it, by then he's going to be wrong. You know, if she learns her lesson three years from now. Uh, she will have still have made up for that lesson that she learns at that point. And so that that made me realize there is completely a new style that completely works. The wife doesn't know anything. Uh, surprisingly, what I found most revealing of that conversation and very interesting to me is the fact that he said to her, OK, you know what? You're right. Uh, I'm wrong. You're doing better than I am with your trading. You know, this wasn't their profession. They, they both have professions. They're doing this on the side. But he has uh, a lot more money to, to, to put in the market. So he said to her, I'm going to give you a lot of money to work with this, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, because you're doing better than me. And the wife said, no, because it's not fun anymore. <laughs> So if you can imagine that, I mean, there's such there's so much to unpack in that statement that the wife who's on a percentage basis doing better is refusing the money because she doesn't care about the money. She's caring about winning points on a virtual game and, and, and it takes it takes the fun out of it if it's significant money. So denken Sie, dass die besten Trader mit dieser neuen Strategie für die Öffentlichkeit unsichtbar sind oder gibt es einige von Ihnen, die im Scheinwerferlicht stehen. You know, I, it's 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 speculation. There's so many people. I have no doubt that there's some people that are under the radar. Um, you know, just like I, I made a reference earlier that it's difficult to predict when your um, uh, next viral post is going to be. You can potentially have a guy that's trying to be vocal about it and says, look at me, I made money or I lost money. And then they, he never gets the visibility because of luck, the time of day that he posted, the words he used in his post, whatever. Uh, so, uh, and some people that may just not want to share that type of information as well. Um, so I, I have a feeling there's a little bit of everything. Die Menschen lieben Geschichten. Haben Sie eine oder zwei Geschichten über Wall Street Bets, an die Sie sich selbst gerne erinnern? I do, but it never comes out the right way. It's a story that it's, it's technical in, in nature. Um, the, the, the story was about a guy, uh, who who first discovered the variant on the infinite margin glitch, which was famous last year for people that, that were over leveraging. This guy took uh, must have learned in some class that that you can use options through a really sophisticated method to do something called a box spread, which on paper or in school is a risk free strategy. Right. So this means and I apologize if this is technical, but this means you're long and short both calls and puts, right? So that's a four-pronged position where you're betting that the the the, the stock is going to go up and you're and you're also taking the other side of that same bet and you're also betting that the market is going to go or that stock is going to go down and you're also taking the other side of that same bet with other people, all right? It's complicated, uh, but essentially on paper it mathematically makes money. Historically nobody does this this risk-free approach because commissions eat off. You have to You have to make four separate trades at the same time, and then you have to make them again to get out of that trade. So that's a number of eight commissions, and that usually eats up the little the little bit of profits. And so he he said, Robinhood lets me do it free. I'm going to do it. And so he picks the most abstract instrument that is so complex. So we're already talking about doing box spreads, which are very complicated. And then he decides to pick a, an ETF, which is complicated, about a index called the VIX. The VIX is a volatility index. It measures the implied volatility of the stock options within the S&P 500. If I've lost you up until now, it's okay, right? It's very complicated. And uh, 
uh, and this ETF was leveraged. And I, as far as I know, it might as well have been inversed as well. I don't remember. And and so if you can imagine the recursive nature of having stock options under a complicated stock option strategy using an underlying um, that's a leveraged derivative of a measurement of the implied volatility of the very options he's trading, uh, <laughs> uh, more than he can stomach, but he was real confident that he knew what he was doing. And so he made this first trade and you realize that Robin Hood, the broker didn't, didn't, um, set aside the money he needed in order to, to, uh, cover that, that trade in case he lost, which in his head was impossible. So he decided to use that money that wasn't blocked off to do it again. And when that money wasn't blocked off, he did it again and again and again and again. And he said it himself that he only stopped repeating it because the market closes at four o'clock and that's when he got to stop. And so he, the first day deposited $5,000 in his account and he's got three or $400,000 worth of a position that's open. And he's bragging about this on Wall Street. Bet said, look what I did. You know, I took very little money. And, you know, according to this, I'm going to make $50,000 in the, the course of the next couple of months. And everyone's jumping and saying, no, 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 you're crazy. And he goes, no, I'm not crazy because look, nobody's going to uh, exercise these options, whatever it is. And so the next day, um, he decides to, to, he gets a little nervous. He decides to take some money off. He started to make a little bit of money. So he, he, he removed $10,000 from his account, meaning he took a hundred percent profit. And then somebody, uh, somebody exercised, they assigned him one of the, the legs of the options, which means that the, and they unraveled his entire bet and, and it cascaded, right? Cause that forced him to, to liquidate all the other bets that he had. And he ended up with a negative account of 60 something thousand, fifty seven thousand dollars $57,000. Uh, but he just closed his account up, uh, and walked away and never had to worry about that $57,000. He made $10,000. And, uh, the beauty of that is almost poetic, right? This guy over leveraged himself the way that the banks did in 2008. He got bailed out by the broker because they couldn't collect the money that he didn't have. <laughs> he had no idea what he was doing, much like the people in 2008 didn't have any idea what they're doing. And he made money just like the people in 2008 did. <laughs> so I, t to me, that was just a beautiful story. Uh, he, he exploited problems in the issue. He, he, uh, sorry, he exploited problems in the broker. He shared them on social media. He used insane amounts of leverage, he took crazy amounts of risk. The username he picked was just beautiful for this. And it's, it's my favorite story because of its technical nature. All das finden wir in einem Buch, das Sie über Wall Street Bets geschrieben haben. Könnten Sie bitte ein paar Worte darüber erzählen? Yeah, yeah, that's one of the stories in, in the book. I, I shared uh, several stories. So the book really talks about the tendency of the this new generation of users, of participants in the market, right? So I go over a lot of these, these themes that I've shared, which is how these millennials are using the stock market like a casino. And, and they walks them through starting with the 2008 financial crisis and talks about all the regulatory permissions and the incentives by the government, as well as the incentives by the brokers, uh, the perverse incentives by the brokers, and basically all the different mechanics of it as to why this thing is happening. And I predicted GameStop, you know, not I didn't predict that GameStop was going to be the one uh, that was going to come out big. But I did predict that these guys were going to exploit these brokers that are not ready for for this type of uh, army of, of traders that aren't afraid of margin calls. Uh, and I use throughout this the, throughout the book as I'm explaining all the different concepts, I'm sharing stories from. Uh, traders that have that, that illustrated, you know, how, the, the concepts that I'm trying to share to make it an entertaining read. Haben Sie selbst ein erfolgreiches Meme auf den Weg gebracht? W was I able to pull out a meme of, of what? Ein erfolgreiches Meme, das oft geteilt wurde. Oh, no, I, I never, no, that, that was never really my thing. Um, Uh, as a moderator, I, I you know, I, I focus on making some funny statements or some ironic um, uh, insights, you know, like the joke around on Twitter. But I've never really been much of making memes. I very much appreciate the creativity of everybody else. Ich danke Ihnen sehr für die Einblicke. Jamie, es war mir ein Vergnügen. Danke für Ihre Zeit. Yes, thank you very much. This was, uh, this was great.